Good evening. I'm Kelda Yoon. The cleanup continued today after yesterday's storm that caused widespread flooding across the GTA, cutting out power, damaging homes and businesses, and leaving commuters stranded. And there were numerous rescues, ranging from people stuck in their cars to those trapped in elevators. But one of the more dramatic scenes took place at a Mississauga long-term care home that was flooded. Nama Weingarten joins us live from outside Tyndall Seniors Village. And Nama, tell us more about what what happened there? Well, Kelda, 114 residents had to be evacuated from Tyndall Seniors Village. That's right here behind me. Mississauga Fire describes this as one of the most significant calls they had during the flood Tuesday, with this rescue taking about 12 hours to complete. Just earlier today, I spoke with the CEO who's in charge of this facility, and here's what she and others had to say to describe the chaos that unfolded. I was just walking through and I was measuring the, the high water mark and it came to just uh, under my rib cage. So people were in water uh, up to their waist. Thankfully, no injuries were reported because of the flood. There are no seniors that live on that first floor, but that is where their lounge, kitchen and dining rooms are. Water essentially made its way from the nearby creek into this parking lot. That's where the flooding started. Yesterday uh, for residents was a day like no other. Uh, when they say it's a hundred year flood, it happens probably once in someone's lifetime. Mississauga Fire Captain Dan Hurd and his crew were at the scene. Personally, I have never had to deal with something like this. He says the crew cut a hole in a wooden fence that allowed most of the water to flow back to the creek. With the help of an inflatable rescue boat and chairs that are able to go up and down the stairs, they were able to get the seniors out. We know our, our lifting and carrying techniques. So we were able to remove um, residents from the second, third and fourth floor. Uh, and we were able to remove all of the residents and uh, staff from the building within the uh, within the hours that we were there. Global Medic, a disaster relief organization, was also there giving out hygiene and comfort kits to people who were displaced. Many of them have gone into other long term care facilities, but you know, they didn't get like their soap and toothbrush and toothpaste and other items with them. So we brought them some of that. Well, that's a tough situation. You can imagine, you know, being forcibly removed from your long term care home, having to be carried out by boat. It's pretty traumatic to a lot of, you know, folks that are vulnerable. Now, there is no timeline just yet for when residents are going to be able to return here. Structural engineers still have to determine when this building is safe to return. And then, of course, there's also the cleanup. But, Kelda, in the meantime, they did secure four different facilities that these seniors are going to have to stay in, two long-term care homes and two hotels. All right, thanks so much for this, Nama. CBC's Nama Weingarten live in Mississauga tonight. Toronto's Union Station reopened today following a big cleanup. The historic building finished undergoing extensive renovations at a cost of hundreds of millions of dollars just three years ago. But as Clara Pasika reports, that didn't prevent the station from being inundated with water. Trudging through Union Station took on a whole new meaning for some commuters yesterday who found themselves braving a growing indoor lake at Union Station to get where they needed to go and not necessarily a very clean one while others took in the sights of a waterfall. It was pretty bad. I had to take my shoes off to walk through the water. Um, yeah, it was blocked every which way, but um, literally saw like waterfalls down the stairs yesterday. Yeah, it was pretty surprising. City staff worked to get the station back to operational and all cleaned up as quickly as possible, earning praise from the mayor. I also want to thank the TDC workers. Um, that kept the system running and restore services at all stations this morning. Many of these commuters are wondering why the city's main transit hub could be hit so hard. I kept saying to myself, wasn't this place recently renovated? Yeah, so I thought that all of that would have been taken care of. It's kind of crazy, like a big city like Toronto, and it's standstill after simple brain fill. I think everybody should take part in making sure that infrastructures like these are ready for any future disasters, but also just making sure that everything is uh, efficient. I definitely think government needs to do more because this is the largest city in Ontario. Hundreds of thousands of people come through here on a regular basis. The City of Toronto owns most of the station and spent $824 million in a decade-long renovation of the station, wrapping up in 2021. The Toronto City Manager says when it comes to planning for extreme weather, there's only so much you can do. We're talking about getting, you know, months worth of rain in a few hours. 
it's really hard to see how you would engineer and design in this type of a, a, of a city uh, to fully protect uh, the way it works. So could it have been worse? Probably with old technology in our old system. He says yesterday's event was unique, but the day was a testament to how well the city can manage. That's the good news story in, in that, that we did not have to shut down Union Station for a long period of time in order to remediate it. Many GO Transit riders were affected by the flooding yesterday, but Metrolinx now says that most stops and routes are now back in operation. The TTC also had some stations that were out of commission, but they're now back in service. Clara Pasika, CBC News, Toronto. Many are calling on policymakers to do a better job of reacting in the case of a significant storm like yesterday's. Experts also calling on the city to build a better plan so that stormwater infrastructure can actually handle floodwaters in the future. Chris Glover has more. Images now seared into people's minds. Drivers trapped on highways needing rescues. Transport trucks navigating the Don Valley Parkway like cruise ships. The potentially dangerous scenes should never have been allowed to happen, according to this climate adaptation expert. When you know that an extreme rain event is coming, shut it down. People can't use it anymore. It will be um, annoying to, to not have that available, but it could save lives and, um, and people's cars and, and money. Our early predictions and estimates working through Environment Canada um, uh, data and all the rest was that we were going to see significant rain, but rain that we felt we could handle. Toronto City Manager says a review is now underway for future major rain events. What I expect us to have next time is better understanding of how we can use the data we're collecting to make better decisions. But to sit there the day after and say always, well, we could have done this and this, the Don Valley is just one example. The DVP likely the best problematic example, built low in a floodplain where floodwaters naturally go in a city generally paved over decades ago. The Don River has burst its banks multiple times over the years, including the dramatic flood of 2013. The best way to floodproof the city going forward, introducing new materials, more culverts, and even wetland and marsh areas throughout the downtown, according to this University of Waterloo expert. How do you build in more wetlands and things of that nature when so much of the city's already kind of accounted for. It's complicated um, and it's costly, but there is a permeable pavement, for example. Other cities in Canada use porous pavement options and examples of inner city wetlands designed to soak up intense rainfall, also known as sponge cities, exist in multiple cities in China. So it's costly to implement um, these adaptation measures, but it's costing us so much more money every time that we're impacted uh, by one of these events. So it, in the long run, it makes sense. We just have to make that mental switch, which we don't tend to do until we're impacted by some sort of major climate um, issue. Maybe the silver lining is this one was bad enough that it might have, it crippled the city yesterday. So it might be enough <laughs> that it finally wakes us up. I think so. I So many of the videos that we saw and some people being impacted, like Drake being impacted, you're like, oh, even very, very rich people can be impacted <laughs> by this. Former city planner Jennifer Keysmat was quick to point out online, attempts in the past to pay for better stormwater infrastructure have failed at City Hall. We must take action to build the resiliency uh, of our city and uh, work to mitigate the impact of these storms. Now the mayor says she's ready to pay for it. We've put aside money in the province, half of it. The, the federal government hoping, we hope that they would uh, join in with that flood protection work. Some will naturally look here, the massive flood mitigation projects in the Portlands, one that includes completely redesigning the mouth of the Don River. It's being built with wetlands and various overflow channels to capture water. The eight-year projects are expected to be fully operational by next summer. So this summer, Unfortunately, we're not getting any of that protection, but next summer, once we have the flood protection that you're talking about, do you foresee an incident like what we saw yesterday happening again, even with all that mitigation work that you're talking about? We do, in fact, expect that uh, same issues to happen because the areas that we're flood protecting weren't impacted by the floods yesterday. Turns out those major flood mitigation projects will help protect the new massive community being built in the Portlands, floodproofing 240 hectares of land south of Lakeshore to Lake Ontario. This is maybe depressing, <laughs> a little bit more depressing <laughs> than I thought our interview would be, sir. <laughs> Don't go <know> that. <laughs> but important information nonetheless.
It is. It's, uh, it, it is. It's important, and I think that you know that that misconception, it, it, you know, may be um, uh, may be a little more widespread. Um, and uh, so we've been trying to let people know that. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, the work we're doing very important. Um, we're going to protect uh, a lot of assets, um, public assets, private assets, and lives. Is you know is not solving that problem. It's solving a different problem. And while the Portland's flood mitigation work won't prevent this from happening again, at the very least, they provide a blueprint to the rest of the city of how to floodproof effectively. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. Welcome back. We have a major update tonight on the outbreak of listeriosis linked to recall plant-based beverages. Health Canada says two people have now died. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency announced the recall last week for several types of silk brand and great value brand plant-based milks. And so far, the government says 12 people have become sick, 10 of them in Ontario. People across Canada are being urged to throw out recall products. The case of Ontario's self-proclaimed crypto king was in front of a judge today. Aidan Platursky is accused of taking tens of millions of dollars from investors and blowing much of it on his lavish lifestyle. Lawyers are arguing whether he should be discharged from bankruptcy, with an accounting firm responsible for tracking Platursky's finances saying he's hiding assets and income. Angelina King has the latest. This is the self-proclaimed crypto king, Aidan Platursky. He didn't show up for his own bankruptcy hearing today. But the bankruptcy trustee's lawyer had a lot to say about why the 25-year-old shouldn't be discharged from bankruptcy, a move that would likely mean he no longer has to pay off his debts. Arguing Platursky has not cooperated with the process, operated a Ponzi scheme, and has no remorse, saying in court, Mr. Platursky should be embarrassed and ashamed of his conduct, but he clearly is not. And this is precisely the reason he should not be granted a discharge. The trustee says Platursky has been hiding income and assets that should be going to the investors who lost money including $430,000 worth of virtual weapons he sold online, at least $6,000 he made by managing the accounts of creators on the adult website OnlyFans, and $700 from streaming online. What are we going to do when we hit 100 followers? How are we going to celebrate? In an affidavit, Platursky denies he operated a Ponzi scheme and that he's hiding anything. The bankruptcy proceeding has found of the $41.5 million investors gave him, Platursky only invested 1.6% of it and spent nearly $16 million on himself, renting private jets, buying luxury cars and leasing a lakefront mansion in Burlington. 160 investors have proven in total they lost close to $27 million. So far, the bankruptcy proceeding has only recovered $3.3 million. Potersky says he actually invested nearly all the money, but the trustee couldn't account for that because he gave incoming investors money to outgoing investors to avoid paying large exchange fees. His lawyer arguing Platursky is young. The investment operation grew out of control and he didn't have a proper accounting system in place, saying, this is not someone with ill intent. He wasn't here trying to make off with as much money as he could and run away from the investors. He could have, he didn't. Internet money gang, internet money. When it comes to the allegations of not cooperating with the process, Platursky says it was compromised from the beginning because of this man, Akil Haywood, an investor who lost money. Platursky says he was concerned for his safety because Haywood was threatening him and he told the trustee about it. Haywood was appointed to a role that helps guide the bankruptcy investigation and Platursky says that's why he didn't share some information with the trustee. He was scared for his life. Then... I'm sorry. I really am. I didn't want to or mean to ruin anybody's life. This video was sent to CBC Toronto last summer, recorded during an alleged kidnapping of Platursky. Haywood was charged and pleaded not guilty. Platursky has since been hit with criminal charges of his own, fraud and money laundering. He's also pleaded not guilty. The trustee's lawyer is arguing if Platursky is discharged, there should be conditions in an effort to prevent him from victimizing others, including that he pay back more than $13 million and be banned from obtaining credit. The judge will ultimately decide if Platursky is discharged from his bankruptcy and, if so, what, if any conditions will be imposed on him. 
The judge says he expects to release his decision in the next day or two. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. Peel police are searching for a suspect after a shooting in Brampton that left a man with serious injuries. The uh, victim, he was on the driveway at a residence when the multiple shots were fired and some of them that struck the victim and then the suspect fled the vehicle, in, the, in, a, in a vehicle. It happened around 9.30 this morning on Inder Heights Drive near Kennedy and Mayfield. Police initially said a man was rushed to hospital in critical condition. They're now saying his injuries are not life-threatening. Police also saying they don't have a suspect or vehicle description at this time. Peel Police also releasing details tonight on what is being described as the service's largest ever seizure of illegal firearms. June 18th, 2024, a series of coordinated search warrants and arrests took place across the GTA, southwestern Ontario, as well as in Detroit, Michigan. More than 100 officers from Peel Police, York, London, Hamilton, Halton, Durham, the OPP, Canada Border Services, as well as the ATF took part in this operation. A total of 71 firearms were seized, of which 67 were handguns and four were assault-style rifles. Ten men from communities across southern Ontario, including Toronto, were arrested. They face nearly 200 charges. Investigators also seized ammunition and illicit narcotics with a street value of more than a million dollars. CBC News has obtained data showing a growing problem in Canada's trucking industry. Companies that hire drivers and then fail to pay their wages. Jonathan Gatehouse has more. Lately, Saurav Sani feels like he's been spinning his wheels. A recent immigrant, he landed a job as a trucker, hoping the long hours would translate into a big check. At that time, they officially give like uh, pay charts and everything. They said they're going to be paying this amount. But after making two trips from Toronto to California, he's out $3,000 because the company didn't pay. But they didn't fulfill their promises. Sani is not alone. Trucking is big business in Canada, now employing close to 350,000 people. But there seem to be few speed bumps for companies that fail to pay their workers, even though these private firms are federally regulated. Wage theft is probably the biggest problem we're seeing in the trucking industry right now. Navi Ajla runs a non-profit organization that helps truckers recover unpaid wages. Her team helps Sani send his complaint to Ottawa. She says the feds aren't keeping up with the surge in claims. In the last year, it's gone from like six months, it takes to start a case, to eight months, and now recently we're getting emails from the labour program saying it's 10 to 11 months. Seamus O'Regan, the Minister of Labour, declined an on-camera interview. His office provided a statement saying it takes the issue very seriously and is working to strengthen the payment order system. Data obtained by CBC News shows the ministry issued 542 wage payment orders against trucking companies in 2023. This year, the pace has almost doubled, with 491 orders in just six months. CBC News also reached out to Hardev Tagger, the owner of the trucking firm that employed Saurav Sani. He declined to come on camera, but admits he owes about $18,000 to ex-employees. Money, he says, he doesn't have but will pay back when he can. Sani says the missing paycheck caused hardship. I was struggling for my installments, monthly installments for insurance, rent, everything. Yeah. Even I have to borrow money from my friends. And now holds out little hope of ever seeing that lost pay. Jonathan Gatehouse, CBC News, Toronto. Colette, uh, a much calmer day mm -hmm. today, and I am looking forward to the more comfortable temperatures the next couple of nights. Yeah, I think we needed a yeah. little calm down with the weather situation. Oh, yeah. yeah, a chance to kind of clean up for, for one and just relax a little bit uh, too and not have to worry about things. And we are seeing that pattern changing, so less humid, uh, cooler as well, and we will get clearing skies overnight tonight. So uh, when I say cooler, it means you know, temperature's comfortable enough that if you want to open the windows and turn off the air conditioning tonight, you probably will be able to do that. I'll show you the numbers in a moment here. And the change of direction with those winds. So behind this cold front, this new air mass that's moved in, we're getting more of a north to northwesterly flow, and that's bringing those temps down and the humidity down as well. And then guess what? Yeah, give it a couple of days as we go into the weekend. Temps will rebound and we'll get our daytime highs and even those overnight lows back to normal. And at this time of year, a normal 
normal daytime high is 27 and low is 17, just to give you some perspective there. And look at today's highs, right bang on for normal for Toronto at 27, a little warmer Oshawa and St. Catharines there at 28. And most of the numbers there kind of within that region, a little cooler there, Barry at 24 with that front moving on through. Uh, some of the active weather was more towards southwestern Ontario or northern and eastern Ontario. And then a lot of the energy stateside, uh, just a little tiny bit of cloud cover as we go through the day Thursday into the afternoon. Otherwise, a lot of sunshine. And we have that dry pattern into Friday as well, even Saturday to give you that heads up. Um, so that chance to really take a breather, dry things out, but also enjoy the sunshine. We will be experiencing a very high UV index with all of that sun around and the sun angle that we're still at at this time of year. Taking a look at what's going on with those winds then, the red arrow showing you that direction as that front goes through. Now at times a little bit breezy and maybe 30 to 40 kilometers an hour, some of the breezes that we'll be seeing, especially around Georgian Bay or in the lee of Lake Huron. Um, but otherwise the wind's not a big factor here other than it's just gonna have a different feel to it when you don't have the higher dew points. So the moisture content of the air molecules surrounding your body, it's gonna be lower. And that does make it for most uh, way more comfortable to be outside and exercising or if you're working outdoors uh, as well. Overnight temperatures then, this is what uh, I was talking about. Look at some of those readings there for Peterborough, Kitchener, for example, 12, 13, London, uh, Hamilton, uh, Yes, I have us at 13. We'll kind of see uh, if that happens in around 15, 16, the low for us into Toronto. 23, the high tomorrow, and then we pick it back up as we are heading towards the weekend back to normal, as I say, Kelda. All right, thanks so much, Colette.